What's up, everybody? I'm the Hook, and I'm the Blade, and welcome to the Blade Hook Podcast, the best Assassin's Creed podcast. I'm your host Lawson, and with me, as always, is my co-host Timothy Chalamet. How are you doing today, Tim? Hey, I'm pretty good. What did you dream about last night? <laughs> um, let's see. What did I dream about? I, oh yes, I I had a dream um, that I like shaved my facial hair off because I have a little bit of facial hair. Not a, not a little bit. I have a I have a beard, and so I had a dream that I shaved it off. But shaving it off made me look like a like like a different person. Like I turned into like a different human. That's kind of what happens when you shave your facial hair. Yeah, I like but my facial features were different. I was like I was like Drake Bell all of a sudden. Oh. Yeah, I know. That's better than my dream. I dreamt that I killed a man and got away with it. <laughs> <laughs> not even joking it was so weird i, I would prefer your dream a <laughs> um, couple notes at the top of the show for you guys uh first of all i have a wicked case of strep throat right now um so if you hear any vocal weirdness or coughing or stuff like that um you know that's just it is what it is um also we want to say that um lots of lots of crazy stuff going on in the world right now we hope everyone's staying safe um we are going to echo the sentiments of our fellow community members here, Black Lives Matter, uh, obviously. And we hope that everyone who's listening is safe and healthy. We're kicking off this episode with our recurring segment, the Valhalla News Roundup. And we actually have a huge surprise for you guys, because joining us for this segment in our first ever interview on the podcast is none other than the lead writer of Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Lord and Savior of the Assassin's Creed franchise, Darby McDevitt. First off, Darby, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for taking the time to ask us questions. We wanted to ask you, why does Eivor have the hidden blade on the outer part of the wrist? It, it is a deliberate decision. When he or she gets a hold of this hidden blade, it occurs to Eivor that it would be much more interesting to let people see this weapon, to be conspicuous about it. Uh, Vikings were known... That's really interesting. Thank you. You've said on Twitter that there's a specific narrative reason behind why Eivor can be either male or female. And obviously, you know, we don't want you to spoil anything. But can you give us like a tiny hint towards what that might be? I feel like Assassin's Creed is kind of almost a, 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 the new Doctor Who. What would you say attracts you most to the time period and setting of Valhalla? Oftentimes, people would not be punished for murder. There have been rumors that uh, Desmond is not really dead, but just trapped in the Animus and could make an appearance in Valhalla. Would you like to, to comment on that or tease anything? He is inside the Animus. Hold on. Are you confirming for the first time on our show that Desmond is alive? He is inside the Animus, inside of its programming and its architecture. Holy shit. Wow. So... I know that this game is set in the late 800s, a few centuries before Ezio was born, but some people have pointed out that the guy we see in the cinematic trailer wearing a hood kind of looks like Ezio. We're wrapping up Ezio's story. And oh my god. Ah! Oh, you heard it here first, folks. Desmond is back. Ezio is back. Assassin's Creed is back. Long live Assassin's Creed. Darby, man, thank you so much for joining us. Very funny about the hook and the blade. That's us. Oh, he, he left the Zoom call. <laughs> wow. Desmond and Ezio, can you believe that, Lawson? No, I can't. So, um, <laughs> our main topic for this episode is the comic book Assassin's Creed Conspiracies. Um, right off the bat, spoiler warning, if you haven't read Assassin's Creed Conspiracies, don't. But if you mm -hmm. want to anyway, um, we're going to yeah. talk about everything that happens in it. Yeah, I cannot recommend reading this in good faith, but if no. you care about being spoiled about something you haven't read yet, I'd go ahead and just give it a very brief overview <laughs> honestly if you just read like the wiki article for the main character you will understand the story better than if you read the comic absolutely i i, I concur that's something i was surprised by first time i read the comic i was like i don't really understand what happened in this comic yeah me and then too. i read it again and i was like i understand it a little bit better and then i read it oh well, no i only read it twice <laughs> but then i read the wiki pages for some of the characters and stuff in it and I was like, now I think I get at least what they were going for. Yeah, shout out to the wiki people. Shout out to the wikia, or I guess it's called fandom now. Yeah. But they did a great job of uh, condensing all of the elements of the story into uh, an easily digestible article. Yeah, it definitely was a saving grace for me, for sure, because I definitely came away from the comic and I really didn't know really what had happened. 
with just a lot of the historical elements, but not only that, but like just character motivations and character alignments. I'm just going to go ahead and say this. My main complaint with conspiracies is how convoluted it is. There are so many little plot switcheroos and so many like big exposition dumps in it that it makes reading it the first time without any context, especially if you don't have, yeah, if you don't have the wiki article on hand, right? a lot of it just isn't going to make intuitive sense. Yeah, it, it seems like a lot of the character's main function is to just tell you plot. Yeah. Like 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 the main bald bad man of the mm. story is essentially just like exposition. Man, he's he like he's he's not he's hardly a character. Oh yeah. No. I mean, honestly, most of the characters in this are are barely characters. Uh, I mean, okay, like here for fun, describe Julia. <laughs> Like, just by personality traits, what would you say? Uh, woman. <laughs> That's um, not a personality trait. You've already failed. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> uh, uh, ponytail. No, pers- Come on. Damn. Personality. Um. Um. <laughs> where's a hood? No. God. Oh, three strikes. You're out, Tim. You failed. Yeah, damn you it. Failed. Yeah, honestly, even the same for Eddie. What would you say about Eddie? He has a Daniel Day Lewis mustache. He, he kills gets his name. Hey, end. that's physical. I know. I'm. Ju- I'm saying. I'm saying physical. Well, okay. Anyway, <laughs> I didn't. I don't play by my own rules sometimes, Tim. I'm a rule well, breaker. I'm a loose cannon podcast host. See, it's it's funny you mentioned Eddie though, just because well, because he's, he's the main character of the thing character. we're talking about. He's the goddamn main character. It's not funny. <laughs> it's interesting that you mentioned the main. <laughs> anyway, um. He sucks. He's the worst part of the book for me. And I like I look, your complaint is 100% accurate. It's very convoluted. But Eddie to me is the worst part of of, of this book. Really? If Eddie was better, I would have liked it more. Yeah. But the reason why I like it so so little is because Eddie is just a nothing character. Eddie does suck because Eddie just does not have a whole lot of agency in the plot whatsoever. Like he's not making any decisions. He doesn't really undergo an arc. Like you can say he undergoes an arc. If by arc, you mean he is completely passive and characterless for the entirety of the story. And then in the very last scene he's in, he does a complete 180 change. Yeah. And I mean, Eddie kind of represents the thing with Assassin's Creed protagonists that I hate the most is that, they just kind of use the assassins as a means to an end. They join the assassins uh, because they need to acquire some kind of skill or knowledge to get their own revenge. And, you know, that was my main issue with Arno as a character. Um, and uh, Aaliyah most recently in Gold. They just kind of join the assassins because it's like, well, I guess I have to. Right. And and, hey, and least, Eddie is kind of a... At least he has more of a motivation than, like, oh, the, the assassins offered to pay for my school. He His character is definitely just, like, a vehicle for, for other people's motivations. Like, at first, he joins the fucking Nazis because they're like, hey, you should join the Nazis. You know, do some recon for us. And then he's like, okay. And that's it. And, he, and he's in the Nazis for years and makes a really stupid mistake and... Gets some gets the whole operation blown, and it's it's just and he's like okay, well I guess I need actual assassin training now because I fucked up so badly. Eddie is nothing special, or so it seems at the beginning. He's basically a former soldier who now runs a shipping company uh, in London, and so suddenly when the assassins are seeking him out and they're like, hey, we think it would be really cool if you um, helped us with our spy mission and infiltrated the SS on our behalf and dedicated your life to being a a double agent for us. It's like, well, why is this happening to this guy? Literally at a certain point when they're about to try and convince Eddie, uh, one of the assassin characters says to the leader, hey, why don't I just do this? And there's this whole bad exposition about how, (laughs) well, the Nazi bad guy we're after can basically smell assassins. So if we send someone in who's already part of the Brotherhood, he'll figure them out. But I I don't know how that works at all, nor does the comic, really. But of course, it does become a point later on that they're like, 
well, Eddie, you have this really strong like heritage and lineage of the Assassin Brotherhood. And it's always like, just, you know, get the, get that chosen one shit out of here. We don't, we don't need it. They typically have to do that for modern day protagonists because yeah, if you're going to look into someone's genetic memory, there has to be someone in their lineage who is interesting enough to do that. But if you're just the guy in the past and you're not originally an assassin, you're, you're helping them out with something like, why do you have to be that special? Why do you have to be right. in this long bloodline of assassins, especially when they don't address how you could be in that lineage and know nothing about it, for instance. And well, and to your point, something like about the whole like chosen one shit, you know, it's like, oh, this this person is is very, very, very special and unique to the assassins. And and, and it's like the more you do that, the less unique they become. Like like, for instance, I mean, Ezio was special for a specific reason. But as you try and build reason and like justifications for for being this assassin in the historical period they have to become increasingly more uh, important and unique. And I think the more they do that, the less important and unique they get because Eddie is like a nothing assassin to compare to the rest Literally, of the assassins. Literally, Omar's love interest in gold happens to be a gifted assassin with deep assassin lineage. You know, just yeah. if every character in all of our stories is going to be a chosen one, nobody's a chosen one. Right. And I, and you you uh, were saying to me how you really want like an like an well not how you really want but no, you think no. it could be interesting that an assassin protagonist is just like he doesn't have this like famous bloodline or anything he's just kind of a normal dude or she who's be, who's an assassin or yeah. she normal dude or dudette or neither that could be an assassin and and at, and at this point I agree with you because I just. I don't think every historical character needs to be like the missing piece to everything, you know, and Eddie is apparently like he has this very special lineage that he knows nothing about, as you mentioned. And honestly, like, fascinatingly enough, the only thing that it accomplishes on a storytelling level mechanically to have Eddie be a, a chosen one, quote unquote, with a, a rich assassin bloodline in this story is that it justifies a very cheap and flimsy and unnecessary plot twist, which is this idea that all of the circumstances that they use to get Eddie on their side and to get Eddie into their system doing their work is because he has this important role to play. This is really complicated, and I'm going to try and explain it as best and as concisely as I can, but considering the comic couldn't do that, I'm not sure I'll do the best job either. Eddie is recruited by American assassin spies. Um, he is told by them to infiltrate the SS. He does so. It turns out that, okay, the assassins and the Templars are working together. So where the Templars right. have power over the Axis, the assassins have power over the allies. So they're basically playing racquetball with Eddie because they need him for this thing. And all of the story circumstances that put Eddie in the position that he's in are pretty much designed from the beginning to get him there. And pretty much the first half of the story, everything that's happening to him is, is made up. This sounds like it should be a good or interesting twist, but it doesn't hold up when you reread it. It doesn't make a whole lot right. of sense. The way that characters talk to each other when Eddie's not on the page isn't consistent, for instance, with them having a level of knowledge that is deeper than what they're presented as having. So at the end of the day, you've made him a chosen one. Doing so justifies a flimsy plot twist. Well, you just you just wasted all of our time in this story, basically, because so much of what we're supposed yeah. to follow doesn't matter. Yeah, and if the twist doesn't hold up, then there's no point of having the twist. Oh, no. Like, there, there's no reward mm -hmm. for, like... If some of the best twists you can go back and reread and it all makes more sense. If with this one, as you said, it makes less it sense does. somehow. It does. I think it's like the the worst twist I've ever seen is in the movie Now You See Me. I haven't seen that movie. Is Rez Ahmed in it? No, he's not. Oh, okay. Mark Ruffalo is though, and he plays a bad guy for the whole movie. And then at the end he's like, Surprise, I was a good guy the whole time. Oh, is that the magic movie? Yeah. Oh, were they okay, yeah, they do magic tricks and stuff? They they do Jesse magic Eisenberg? tricks and stuff. 
Yeah. Woody Harrelson? Yeah. Cool. Okay, yeah, I haven't seen it. But I, know, <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I thought you were going to say you had. You're like, oh, yeah, I remember that movie. Oh, yeah, never oh, yeah, saw it. With Jesse Eisenberg and Woody Harrelson where they do the magic stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen it. No. <laughs> It's bad. A spoiler um, alert for now you've seen me. Oh, yeah. Darn, you just spoiled that great movie. I've seen that movie like nine times. Don't ask why. But now they're making a third one, and we know they're going to call it Now You See Me 3 because they're unimaginative fucks. But I really <laughs> want them to call it Now You Three Me. We'll see if this makes it into the final episode. <laughs> <laughs> it might not. Um, so, yeah, conspiracies. Let me just go ahead and say this. This is something I wanted to say earlier but forgot I was going to say. The only conspiracy in this book is uh, when the writer and the artist conspired to make it really fucking bad. <laughs> yeah, there's not, yeah, but it's funny, but there's not a whole lot of mystery to that. There's not a whole lot of conspiracy going on in this book. I I will say it is it is nice that um, the the whole production is French based. Yeah, they can't hear us shitting on this. Exactly. This not that They'll anyone that... <laughs> who speaks English listens to this podcast either, but they <laughs> definitely won't. They definitely won't. Also, I I am genuinely curious who at Titan Comics is responsible for the translation of these because this thing is not well translated. There are a bunch of grammatical errors and punctuation errors and like completely confusing sentences in in this thing. Yeah, there's definitely some translational problems there also i think what's a part of the translational problems is that eddie gorm's name is repeated six thousand times yeah and also that he's named eddie gorm yeah that's not a very impo- opposing it's name. not a great name for a character you know but to your point about the convoluted aspect of the book i think a lot of the convolution is that a word convolution yeah it is i think a lot of that comes from the lack of historical explanation like sure I've never needed uh, the comics or the games to like hold my hand through uh, hit to like the historical context, but they weave the historical elements and the, and the historical figures and the historical events well enough into the game or the comic. Uh, you know, Assassin's Creed two taught me so much about the Renaissance, which I didn't know before. And this, what we read recently, the fall, uh, you know, gave us so much context about the Russian revolution. I disagree. It's not, that, it's not even that big of a part of the, of the book. You're kind of working against a couple of factors. Like, I mean, for me, there's definitely an extent to which different audience members are going to bring different levels of historical knowledge to the table. And I can play a game like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which is set in ancient Greece, and I can meet characters and not be able to tell you one way or the other if they were real people or not, for the most part. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Unless it's a name like Hippocrates or Herodotus or Socrates, I'm not going to be able to say, oh yeah, this guy really existed right and world war ii is it's a historical event that probably there's a lot more general awareness of partially because compared to something like say world war one it's very clear cut who the good guys and bad guys are right and 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 i would agree with that assessment i just think the the book didn't do a great job of setting the stakes in the state of affairs it just was like that this is, is the true. year this is the year it takes place in and you know, here you go. Here's a bunch of uh, name. Here's a bunch of people who are name dropped. Then their significance within the story is kind of explained, but their significance to the world is isn't explained. And I think that's a, an an issue for me. I because... think I think you are hitting on something with the stakes point because a big part of this book revolves around the idea of who gets to build the atom bomb first. Right. If you're not familiar with, you know, Werner Heisenberg or the Manhattan Project. Uh, that might not ring as, I mean, on one hand, it is a clear stake. Like, yeah, if the bad guy makes the bomb first, then that's bad for us. But it is true that the book does not do a great job of establishing what the assassins or Templars want until that reveal in the end what, that they're working together. Because once you actually do a little deep dive, and I know you know this already, once you look into what the Templars are actually doing and what they actually want. It's not intuitive at all from the book that that's what what's going on. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, there was some stuff that you actually dug up about, um, Dia Glocka. Yeah. Like it actually was a thing kind of in real life. And it's, it's really just kind of like passed off as a proto animus in this. 
Yeah. Um, for people who aren't familiar, um, first of all, in the comic book, the first half of, of conspiracies revolves around the idea that instead of focusing on developing an atom bomb, the Germans instead created a cover story uh, of the atom bomb under which they developed a super weapon or Wunderwaffe called Die Glocke. And there is a real life conspiracy theory or really more of a hoax that there was a German super weapon called Die Glocke, called right. such because that's German for the bell. And it's a bell shaped super weapon. Yeah, it's shaped like a bell. And they do take that inspiration and, and use it in the comic in kind of an interesting way. But when you find out that this German super weapon is essentially a proto animus, it's like, what is really the value of this to Germany or to the Templars? I mean, yeah, their their whole deal is they always want to find pieces of Eden. And just like any other animus in any other time, this is going to help them find pieces of Eden. But it's not like there's, say, a particular piece of Eden that would help them turn tide of the war or anything more specific uh, other than, boy, wouldn't it be great if we found more pieces of Eden? Let's build a chair that helps us find them. Right. And it also kind of dig, it also kind of makes this kind of a wrinkle where if if Boris was aware of this proto animus Boris, by the way, then, being the leader of the assassins in the book who recruits Eddie. Sorry, go on. Right. The 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 Gary Oldman looking man. If he is aware of this proto animus, right? Like, because he had to have been, and he was. So how did he let something so powerful like? stay within the Templars over time until we get the actual animus, you know? Well, that's one of the fun, delightful, complete inconsistencies of the book. <laughs> no. Yeah, and I mean, the, it's just, I just, I, I just, I hate so much that, like, I don't know, Boris's plan just, just really sucks, too. It, yeah. he, he really doesn't keep Eddie, he doesn't keep Eddie on a short leash, I don't mm -hmm. think. He doesn't keep him on a short enough leash if he's really trying to use utilize Eddie in this way. And, I just like, for instance, that scene when Boris is opening up the like the hidden uh, assassin layer and shows everyone. It's like I was like, yes, dope. Yeah, that was and cool. We see none of it. And we see none of it because the creed doesn't matter. Like, that's the thing. And I hate Assassin's Creed stories that are absent of the creed. And this is one of them. It's so absent of it. And it's absent of it to the, to the point where Eddie doesn't like give a fuck. He gives a fuck before he kills himself. All of a sudden, that's it. He, he doesn't even meant like he just joins the conflict to get revenge. He doesn't he doesn't want any anything more than that. It's very surface level. Yeah, I think kind and, of what you're what you're getting at is that like this is one of many modern Assassin's Creed stories that doesn't share the same priorities as early Assassin's Creed stories of really delving into those ideological conflicts and the aesthetics of the Assassin Templar world. Yeah. And that is frustrating. I liked that we got a little taste of it because it is cool to see what those things and those traditions, what they look like in different time periods. So seeing like this is what a group of assassins look like in World War II London is cool. But like you said, yes. they don't push it far enough. They don't take advantage of it and do something cool with it at all. Right. And yeah, I mean, and that's the thing is I think you're completely right in that assessment of like what my problem is with it. Um, I mean... Just going back to what we, just going back to what we read recently, the 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 fall in the chain. I mean, that dealt so well with like what the creed was and the Templars, and what they wanted. And Eddie is an assassin because he was made one. He didn't seek it out. He didn't need it. He didn't want it. Well, he wanted it, but he wanted it for more selfish reasons. And he didn't do anything to impact the creed or at all. He, for good or worse, he just kind of was there. He existed. He shot Tesla, which I don't. And I don't let's go ahead and explain either. again for anyone who's uh, who hasn't read. Uh, one of the fun plot points of this is that um, Nikola Tesla didn't die uh, when he was reported to have died historically. That right. was the Templars faking his death, and then they basically kept him imprisoned as a as a you know state yeah. scientist to work on this project to work him. on the Diaglo. And then the assassins were like, "All right, yoink, we're going to use you now to do the same thing again." Right, which is part of how the Assassins and Templars are kind of supposed to be supposedly working together. But again, there's only so much of that we can really understand when all we get that's really telling that story of, hey, the Assassins and Templars are working together on this, is a character saying, 
yeah, the assassins and Templars are working together. Like, we don't really see what that process is. Yeah. We don't really see those you're characters very, working together at all. You're so right about that. And and that's the thing is the stakes are so are so are set up in such a piss poor way that it's like, okay, the assassins and Templars are working together. Sorry, together because be, because they are. Yeah, you that know? should there's mean no, so no much more than it actually does. Yeah, I mean, there was a whole game that, that talked about that very idea, and it was called Assassin's Creed Unity. And it also has problems. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it also has issues. Yeah. I think one thing that, that kind of is, is the source of a lot of my issues with this book in particular, in any Assassin's Creed story, there are various levels of conflict, right? So you can go up to the macro scale, and you'll see that Assassins and Templars, being these ancient shadowy organizations that they're manipulating various players... A level below that, you have the actual historical factions that really existed, typically. Um, and they'll have some relationship to the Assassins and Templars, whether that's being supported by them, controlled by them, or pit against each other by them. And then you'll have, on the micro scale, you'll have the actual characters. What are their tactics? What are their motivations and goals in this context? And that's really where you have to live, where an Assassin's Creed story has to live, in the context of the bigger levels, but using them to tell a personal story for a character, you know, that's what makes the great Assassin's Creed stories work so well. And that's something I thought about a lot while reading this, because while in essence, some of those pieces are there, no, the comic doesn't give you a great understanding of the fact that, for instance, the Templars pit all of the players in World War II against each other from the get-go to get more power. But then Hitler went from being their puppet to being an out-of-control madman, and suddenly the Templars want to stop him. And that's why, if you have assassins working with the Allies and Templars initially working with the Axis, they can eventually kind of come together against Hitler, which is interesting. That's an interesting context for an Assassin's Creed story, but it's not a context that this comic is interested in litigating at all. Yeah, it's its priorities are all out of whack. And it seems. we're definitely not getting a fascinating personal story for Eddie, who, like I said earlier on, uh, has less of an arc and more of like a falling off a cliff at the very end. <laughs> you can't say that he doesn't end up differently where he starts, but that's just because of a big, just contrived plot device. And I think probably the biggest sin outside of the convolution and outside of the confusion of all of it is that it's just kind of boring. I mean, there's not, the pacing is so broken in this story that there's really nothing moment to moment lending it any reward or any satisfaction or any reason to keep reading. Even compared to something like AC Gold, I could at least listen to that and not feel bored out of my skull. This I'm reading and it's like, I want to give myself paper cuts with the comic book pages just so I can feel something. The The intro of the book it has has sees Eddie Gorm doing this awesome infiltration, and yet that's the only assassin stuff that we get to see him do because the rest of the time he's being saved by Julia or getting her shot. Also, the the rope launcher makes an appearance in that scene, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's just that's another thing is Eddie when he is an assassin he is for a couple pages and then he gets stuck into the proto animus and then after that he's just as a as a madman, and he kills himself. Even when he's infiltrating the SS on behalf of the assassins, uh, he goes from literally being like a dock worker who just helps out one of their guys in a very low-level, pretty meaningless operation. And then pretty much a page later, it's like, okay, it's been three years. Uh, Eddie has gone full Nazi. They have somehow allowed him to rise in their ranks despite the fact that he is a former member of like the Royal Navy whose whole family was killed by Nazis. And then you have the bad guy being like, you know, uh, Hammerstein, what's his name, says you're his best man, his best guy. And it's like, show, don't tell, is really all I can say to that. Show us why he's worthy to you. Show us why he's skilled or talented yes. or capable of anything, rather than just having a right. bunch of scenes where he talks to people, where they're like, wow, Eddie, you're so cool. You're so fucking good at this, <laughs> yeah. Eddie. Yeah, and it's like, and and they try and show you how he's such a cool assassin by killing a couple guards, and it's just like, that's all we see. Otherwise, he fucks everything up. You know, it's like, this book likes to tell you a bunch of things 
why Eddie is a good soldier, why Eddie is a good assassin, why Eddie has this knowledge of the Assassins and Templars, but they don't show it. And I want to say it could have benefited from being longer, but I want to say it's like equal length to the to the fall on the chain, and it does so much less with with its runtime or its page time. I and something say. else I noticed, you know? it has a similar scope too. Like I wanted the fault, I wanted the fault conspiracies for aiming so big in terms of trying to have this multi-year story and trying to have all of these twists and turns, but the fall in the chain completely does all of that. But because it is a lot more thoughtful about the pacing, about the rhythm, I also want to talk about, and normally I don't have that many opinions about art, but there's generally like nothing going on in the background of these comic book panels. They're so lifeless and detailless. So much of the story is being conveyed through the text bubbles, through the dialogue, almost as if you could read this book without any illustrations and it would still make as little sense as it currently makes. Oh, yeah. I mean, you are definitely on the money with that observation. I mean, like some of the art and places looks really great and some of it doesn't look very good. And and you did mention to me that the artist, there there was an artist shift. Yeah. So like the first volume is a different artist than the second. And the second is a little worse, I think. The, the, the beauty of comics is that you read the text bubbles, but then you also see what the text bubbles are encompassing and you get more of the story. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of things in comics that you can just put into the art that you can't read in the text bubbles. Mm -hmm. And there's none of that here. And you know, in a great comic, you can understand the gist of the story. Even if all of the text bubbles are, uh, you know, blocked out, you could still see it in the, in the art and the facial expressions in the world. Another interesting thing that I want to touch on before we wrap this up is that you have the fact that this book actually tries to explain an event that's referenced in an email you can read in Assassin's Creed 1. Are you familiar with the the Philadelphia Project? No, I actually haven't heard about it. Yeah, apparently there's this email in AC1 where it's, it's between Alan Riken and Warren Vidic, and Alan's like, you know, data provided from subject 12 indicates that the ship briefly manifested in a future state for approximately 18 minutes. It is unclear whether the timeline is consistent with or parallel to our own. Although we have recovered enough data to reconstruct and repair the original artifact, blah, 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 blah. The, the point is they, they do this in the comic. They go to the USS Eldridge, which is the ship they're talking about in this email. Um, and they have a quote unquote time machine. Even though Diaglaco works as a prototype animus, they try to have it both ways where it's only an animus because it's like a time machine that doesn't work properly. Right. Apparently there's supposed to be something that they call a fixed point that keeps your mind and your body synced with each other when you travel through time. But because they don't have that point, uh, it works like an animus and you go through the past without your body. And therefore but you're looking through your ancestors. That email almost implies that there is like the, there would be the ability like with the context of the book, at least that there is the ability to fucking time travel, but also use this as an animus, you know, it kind of, yeah, it kind of justifies the existence of both. But what I want to know is if you're going to, if you're going to put a time machine on the USS Eldridge and you're going to say, Oh, this is kind of explaining what that email is all about. Why don't we see the ship manifest in a future state? Why don't we understand how and why that happens? If it does happen, it happens off screen or off panel. It's not a part of the story. So it just seems like they like worked in this element, but didn't really take advantage of it or use it in line with what it actually is supposed to be. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like they were like, okay, what piece of lore and what what piece of obscure lore can we just cherry pick and utilize somehow in this book that hasn't already been explained? Are the writers like, oh, I'm going to look at the wiki to see what we've already established about World War II? Oh, we established that. We'll use that. Time travel. Cool. Diaglock is a time machine. Yeah. It's like, I remember when, when I, when I saw this connection on the wiki, I remembered reading the Philadelphia project thing and thinking, oh, that's cool. Cause it was like time travel in Assassin's Creed. But I read it at a time when, when hearing time travel in Assassin's Creed wouldn't make me shit my pants with fear because I wouldn't trust Ubisoft to do it well. <laughs> yeah. So then to see, oh, wait, this this involved that, which I completely didn't get from reading it. And no. then, yeah, that's the thing is there's no way for you to understand any of that unless you, one, had this 
knowledge of the email or what the Philadelphia project is, you know? Yeah. And so then when I went back to read it again, I was looking forward to seeing, oh, how is this going to explain the whole manifesting the ship in a future state for 18 minutes thing? It doesn't. So, Tim, uh, I think we've pretty well covered our feelings on this book. Um, what would you rate it out of 10? It's two. Yeah. I'm going to go. Yeah. I'm going to say I'm going to say 2.1. Oh, OK, cool. <laughs> I wonder if they're going to like put these ratings on like the 10th anniversary of the book when it comes out. Yeah, maybe like they can pull a, a blurb, a pull quote from us, print it on the back. That'd be cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, It's been fun to talk about conspiracies with you, Tim. Um, As always, we're going to let our, our audience know here. If you like listening to us talk about stupid Assassin's Creed things. Uh, please share the show with people you know who like Assassin's Creed. Um, give us a comment, uh, a tweet, a retweet, a heart, um, a smooch, whatever you want to give us. <laughs> I would prefer that'll a That'll make us feel better. Um, thanks, of course, to Darby McDevitt for joining us yes. in, our, uh, in our Valhalla News Roundup. I, I, I can't thank Darby enough. I mean, I, I... So cool of him to show up. They're just, they're burning, they, these burning questions need answered, and I'm glad that he stepped up to do it. You can reach us on Twitter at Hookblade. Um, I'm also on Twitter at Lawson underscore found. Uh, I'm, at, I'm on Twitter as well. I have a Twitter. Yeah. Uh, zero underscore regen, R-E-G-E-N. And that's how you pronounce it for anyone that might be unaware. Yeah, so um, I have been the hook. And I've been the blade. And this has been the Blade Hook Podcast. We will see you guys next week. Bye. Very funny about the hook and the blade.